بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, last week uh, we finished from Surah Abasa and that was the Surah of our study last week and inshallah ta'ala to continue our tradition before we, th we start with Surah At-Takweer we'll begin by connecting the end of Surah Abasa to the beginning of Surah At-Takweer which is our Surah of study for today. Now we found in the previous two Surah which is Surah Abasa and Surah Al-Nazi'at, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used two words to describe the last day. He said, At-Tamma, At-Tamma Al-Kubra, and As-Sakha. At-Tamma we, we already defined as being the overwhelming calamity, the surrounding calamity, the calamity that surrounds you from all sides. So the idea was that on the Day of Judgment, you're surrounded by all sides, there's no escape. And we said as basically meant the deafening sound, the deafening noise. And both of these words refer to the second blow of trumpet on the Day of Judgment. And now this Surah, Surah Al-Takweer, begins with an explanation of this day and how it unfolds. So in the previous Surah, Allah said, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الصَّاخَةِ when the Sakha arrives, and we said that there are two words in the Arabic language that mean to come, Ja'a and Atta. And we said the difference is that Ja'a will be used for a grand arrival, something very big that's coming. And Atta is something that's light that comes. And you, if you follow this in the Quran, you'll find that Ja'a is only used for big events. So now, how big is this event? Allah said, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الصَّاخَةِ That's the end of Surah Abasa. When the grand, when this big event of As-Sakha finally comes. Now, how big is this event? Well, to know how big it is, we have to read the beginning of Surah At-Takweer. So this is the connection. So we'll find grand events. Big creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ مُتَذَرَتْ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيَّرَتْ That's how big it is, so much so that now the big creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's all going out. It's something is happening to all this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the definition of Ja'at, we find in the beginning of Surah At-Takweer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and I shared this hadith last week, Whoever wants to see the Day of Judgment, if you want to see the Day of Judgment with your eye, then you read, then Rasulullah said, then read Surah Al-Takweer and the Surah that's after Surah Al-Infitar. And also, the previous Surah, Surah Abasa, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, He concluded it by saying, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ The day in which man will run away from his brother. But not only run away, يفر, we said yafir meaning run away with terror. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said on that day, you'll be running away with terror from your brother and ummihi wa abi and his mother and his father and his wife and his children. And this was the chaos that's happening on the earth, on the land. That's what you could see of chaos happening. Now this surah, surah al-takweer, it shifts the focus to the sky. So as this chaos is happening down on the land, surah al-takweer, the camera moves from the bottom, from earth, and it directs to the top, to the sky. And now we see what happens of chaos up in the sky. This is the connection also between surah Abasa and Surah Al-Takweer. Also the end of Surah Abasa, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about two different type of faces. He said, وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ مُصْفِرَةٌ ضَاحِكَةٌ مُسْتَبْشِرَةٌ On that day, there will be faces lit with joy. Musfira, ضَاحِكَةٌ مُسْتَبْشِرَةٌ It will be laughing. It will be laughing, making sound and uncontrollable laughter. And مُسْتَبْشِرَةٌ Because of good news that has and that is be, it's being given. So now Surah at takwir will actually explain to us why are these faces laughing? Why are these people laughing uncontrollably? This Surah will tell us why. And we found, this, we found the second type of faces in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَوُجُوهُ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَلَيْهَا غَبَرًا And faces especially on that day will have dust upon them. They will be covered with dust. The black smoke will be climbing the faces. So Surah al taqwir will tell us where this smoke is coming from and why the face is black and why is it covered with dust. This Surah will explain. And also it will tell us when this will happen. Because, you know, the believer now, you don't always see him laughing. You don't always see his face lit with joy. That's not the case. And the believer, you don't always, the disbeliever, you don't always see his face gloomy and depressed and, and dark and sadness. You don't see this. So that's why it's very important that Allah mentioned Yawma Idhin, especially on that day. So this gives us the meaning of that in this world, the believer could be depressed. He could be sad because of what uh, يعني, wrongful doing the kuffar do to him. And the disbeliever is, could be full of happiness in this world. But it's on that day that the true face will come out. So this surah is very important to come after Surah Abasa to tell us exactly when this face will be lit with joy and when it will be happy and when this face will be really gloomy, sad and depressed and covered with uh, dust. Now, Surah Abasa, which is our Surah today that we're going to study, is a Meccan Surah. It was revealed on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Mecca. And as we always say, the Meccan Surah, the primary audience are the who? Mushriku Quraysh, the pagan Arabs. Because obviously Quran is relative da'wah. It's not like these people are talking about something and Quran is talking about something else. Quran is relative da'wah. So you'll find that the theme that dominates in the Meccan Surah will be three themes. That is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the day of resurrection, the day of judgment when people come out of their grave. And you'll find the issue of revelation. Revelation, the Quran. And why these three themes, especially you'll find in Surah uh, that were revealed in Mecca, it's because Quraysh, that was their sickness. They didn't believe in the oneness of Allah, didn't believe in the day of resurrection, and they denied the wahi, the revelation upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And these three things are a part of one's iman. They're a part of one's faith. So if you deny them, then you have no iman. You become basically a kafir. There's no difference between you and the disbeliever. So this surah, surah the taqwir an overall summary of this surah, you'll find that it begins by depicting the scene of the day of judgment and what abnormal things will take place. And it described, and it's subhanAllah, it's described in such intricate detail. It's like the reader or the listener can see this day unfold right before his eyes. Just as the hadith of the Prophet wasallam explained. It's powerful imagery. You'll find every single word has a, in, an, an image to it. Now the second passage in this surah, you'll find that the, the issue shifts. It goes and speaks about another issue. And that's the concept of risala, The concept of revelation. And it'll speak about the qualities of the messenger that carries this responsibility. And that is referring to Jibreel alayhi salam. 
إنه لقول رسول كريم. Right, these verses might have been familiar. في قوة عند ذي العرش مكين مطاع ثم أمين. These verses are actually these ayat are referring to Jibril عليه السلام, the messenger that has taken the responsibility to carry this wahi, this message, and it powerfully concludes by Allah subhanahu wa taala addressing the issue of what this Quran is all about. And you'll find perfect connection to Surah Abasa, the Surah before Surah Al Taqwir. So as we study this Surah, inshallah ta'ala, we'll explain how these three topics connect to each other and how they're related to the previous Surah, Surah Abasa. Very interesting. <coughs> now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this Surah. He says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ A very common translation will yield when the sun is wrapped up and loses its light and it's thrown away. Now just before we move on and explain, there are just a few things I'd like to share with you uh, in regards to the word إِذَا In regards to the word إِذَا Pay attention. I've put it up on, on the PowerPoint so you can understand it. Because probably it's just a bit difficult, but if you pay attention inshallah, and I purposely chose to study this with you, although it's a bit difficult, just so you can appreciate the Qur'an, and appreciate the words in the Qur'an, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, every single word is in its place. There's nothing that's just brought from here and just throw this word in here. Every single word is put in its place, and it is amazingly, amazingly profound miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, the word إِذَا Literally, it means when. Literally, إِذَا means when. Focus, keep with me. Now in English, when can be used for the past or the future. Right? So English usage, we have the word in the past. When I got home. Right? You can say when I got home. That's the past. And you can use when and speak about the future. So you can say when I get home. Right? And then the, the, obviously your sentence will continue. But we're just focusing on the first bit of the sentence. The condition bit. That's what's known as the condition. So when I got home, what was the result? We're not speaking about the result now. Focus. In English, when could be used for the past and the future. When I got home, when I get home. Now in the Arabic, when you use when, it's two different words for the past and the future. So for the past, you'll use the word if. If is used for the past. And either is used for the future. So you can find the difference in the Arabic and English. English is just casual, you know, it's very easy, simple to understand. One word and you can talk about the future and the past. But in the Arabic, especially in the Quran, there's a difference between if and either. And keep in mind, both of them mean when. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمِ When we told, in the past, because if, when we told the angels to make sujood to Adam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ جَاءَتْكُمْ جُنُودٌ فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا When we sent, in the past, when we sent upon you armies, and so on. That's the verse in Surah Al-Ahzab. And إِذَا Automatically, when you see the word إِذَا Anything that's going to come after is talking about what? Talking about the future. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha qumtum ila salat. O you who believe, O you who claim to have faith, when you get up for salat, in the future he's talking, then what you do and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةِ When you finish the prayer, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, many examples, but we'll conclude with this, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ When the call to the prayer on the day of Jumu'ah on Friday is called. In other words, this is referring to the future. When it calls, then what do you do? That comes in the surah and it's explained there. So now, 
we found this is the usage in the Arabic language. Difference between if and if. Why am I sharing with, with you this? Because we're going to find something that goes against this principle. And this is where we find in the beginning of Surah at taqweer Now, I told you either everything that comes after either the context will be about the future. So when Allah says either shamsu kuwirat, we were actually we were actually supposed to hear either shamsu tukawar. That's how it's supposed to be, and that would mean see because tukawar is the future tense. And that will mean when the sun will wrap up and lose its light. Now that's the normal, that's the normal Arabic. Either shamsu tukawa. That's what we were expecting when we heard either. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't say either shamsu tukawa. He doesn't use the future tense. Rather, He uses the past tense. He says either shamsu kuwirat. And kuwirat is a past verb. Keep up with me, we're almost going to finish this. Now the big question here. This seems, either shams or kuwirat, seems a very big contradiction to the grammatical uh, يعني, principles of the Arabic language. So you will have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, non-Muslims that wrote against the Qur'an saying, look, it's grammatically incorrect. There's one, either shams or kuwirat. But how do we respond to this? Now, I don't, I don't want to respond with you to it. I just want to teach you what this implies. What, what powerful meaning does it imply that when either, which signifies the future, and then Allah speaks about the past. So this is the explanation here. Either shamsu kuwirat will actually translate when the sun is wrapped up and lost its light in the future. But this is in the past because that's the verb that's used. When something is mentioned in the past, in the past tense, but in regards to the future, signified by either, it implies that it certainly will happen. Just as the past for sure is certain, then a future event being mentioned in the past tense, it implies certainty. Surely it will happen. So either shamsu kuwirat, it is so, so certain that Arab, as a matter of fact, it's so certain as if it's the past. So this is how the past comes after either. Allah subhanahu this is the most powerful technique in the Arabic language to make your speech certain. No doubt in your speech. This is the most powerful of ways. This is one thing. Now, another thing with either, you'll find in the Arabic language that there are two words, basically you can say synonyms to each other, that mean when. You have either, which means when. When either comes, it creates certainty. Without doubt, it will happen. Now, the other synonym to either is in, in. And in translates to if. It's also a condition. But if sometimes can mean surely. But most of the times it creates uncertainty and doubt. So subhanAllah, look at this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word idha in the Quran, the first thing it implies, it's talking about something in the future. And the second thing it implies, 100%, no doubt about it, it is going to happen. Let's share a few examples. When one of you reaches death, death is certain, so either is used. Allah says, When the four sacred months finish, and they're going to finish. We're certain about this. So either is used, the certain one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Because if you're a believer, certainly you have to get up for salat. So Allah says, إِذَا قُمْتُمْ Not إِن قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Allah says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةِ 
when you finish the prayer, the prayer is not going to go on forever. You're going to finish it. Certainly, you're going to finish it. So, fa'ivat is used. Now, in when in is used, it creates doubt and uncertainty. <coughs> Follow it in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul in kana lirrahmani walad. Say, if the most merciful had begotten a son. If, meaning it's impossible, it didn't happen. Uncertain and for sure it won't happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا If two parties of the believing groups were to fight, how certain is that? Very rare if it happens. Two believing parties fight, it's very rare. So Allah says, in. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَى A fasiq, someone that rebels against Allah Azza wa Jal's command, that's, it's certain, it seems almost impossible that he's going to come to the Muslims with great news. So Allah said, in. The grammarians have counted either to be used in the Quran 362 times. And each time, it was perfectly placed in its context. Subhanallah. Any, next time you read the Quran, focus on the word in and ida as an assignment for yourself so you can appreciate the beauty of the Quran. That's, that's why I shared this with you. Next time you read it, when you read, think of ida as two things. What's coming or is talking about the future and it is talking about something destined to happen. Something there's no doubt about. And if you read in in the Quran, then think about it as something that's possible, could happen, could not happen, probably it's uncertain, so on. So just to share with you one more beautiful example. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us the ruling of reading the Quran. He says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Most of us when you read this ayah, you only read, oh, when you read the Quran, say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ all right, and so we learn from this that before we read the Quran, we should say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan al rajim You forgot the bit of Ida. What did Ida imply? When you read. It wasn't a matter of if you read the Quran. So the believer is supposed to be reading. So much so that Allah said, Ida qara'ta. Not in qara'ta. The matter of Quran, when it comes to reading Quran, it's not a matter of, oh, if I read, if I don't read. The matter is Ida, when you read. Meaning certainty, you have to read. Well, you're a believer. How a believer doesn't read Quran? What the hell does this make sense? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ SubhanAllah, a lot of things are missed like this in the translation. طيب. That was for this. Now, let's continue and mention one more other thing that happens in this ayah that's also abnormal to the grammatical rules. Normally when the Arab speaks, they use the verb before the noun. So he won't say, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ He will say, إِذَا كُوِّرَتِ shams. The verb comes before the noun in Arabic language. There's no doubt about this. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in this ayah, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ What did He place first? The noun. And then Kuwirat, the verb, came second. So now this indicates to an abnormality in speech. And this technique is used when somebody doesn't believe what you say. So the speaker raises his voice and has to put his words in a way that sounds abnormal so it can capture the attention of the listener and make his words more believable. This illustrates the anger and frustration of the speaker and even the tone and the volume of the voice of the speaker. All this is depicted by when the noun comes before the verb. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, He is speaking to those, these ayat in Surah Al-Takweer, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ He's actually speaking to those who are in denial of the facts of the Day of Judgment. And by placing a shams, the noun, before the verb, 
he's enforcing the reality of this event. So now we won't translate this as when the sun is wrapped up. We'll translate this as when in fact the sun does get wrapped up. The volume is, is increased. It is already illustrating Allah Azza wa Jal's frust frustration and anger at the disbelievers. Now why is this so important to know? And so important to pay attention. Why did I share this with you? Because when we understand this and what it implies, we get a better understanding of who this surah is intended to. To which audience is it intended to? And in this case, it is the disbelievers who are in doubt about the last day. And these are the worst type of kuffar, the most adamant type of, type of disbelievers. So now, already we've created this scene. We still haven't even spoken about the ayah, now we're going to speak. But now you already have this idea of Allah Azza wa Jal expressing His frustration and anger by placing the noun before the verb. And another thing we know, what's implied in the ayah is that these events are certain, they're going to happen, no doubt about it, signified by either. Now, one more thing. If the noun came before the verb, what did it illustrate? It, uh, sorry, it, it, it illustrates first the abnormality. There's abnormality in speech. It's not right speech. If you were to, for example, if you were back then, now obviously people don't pay attention to this, but if you were back then in the deserts with the Arabians and you placed the noun before the verb in your speech, Everyone will be shocked and look at you shockingly. You know, how do you do this? What are you doing? This you don't make sense. You know, just like in English now, someone speaking that doesn't make sense. Everyone will look shocked. You know, he's, this guy is on the podium and he's talking, and well, I would understand what he's talking about. It's shocking. You will look at him and in shock. Now the Arab will do the same thing. So when Allah says either shamsu kuwirat, he's shocked. This Quran is claiming it's the most eloquent piece of work and yet look look at the floor the noun is coming before the verb but subhanallah look at this isn't the ayah speaking about something abnormal that's going to happen to the sun the ayah is speaking about when the sun is wrapped up and its light is lost which is something abnormal to how we perceive the sun every day so subhanAllah, the ayah, the structure of the ayah came abnormal to reflect and to point out to the abnormalities of that day. So the same way you're shocked hearing will be the same way you're shocked when you see what happens to the sun. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ Now, let's begin. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ الشَّمْس This is the most common word and the most common name for the sun. Kawwarat comes from the word Kawwara. And Kawwara literally means to wrap something up. Now there are other words in the Arabic language that mean to wrap something up. Who can give us one? Laf. Laf, right? You know Laf. Matwi. Atawi. This means to wrap something up. So what's the difference between Laf and Kawwara? Why doesn't Allah say the shamsu nuffat? He says either shamsu kawwarat. Now, this word kawwara, this verb, is used specifically for turbans. When you wrap a turban around the head, you will use the verb kawwara. So the Arab would say, akara al imamata ala rasi. The person wrapped the turban around his head. Now the idea is that the turban is long, right? It's this long piece of cloth. And now you're wrapping it, you're closing it off. So the idea is that the light of the sun, the light of the sun is stretched out. And it's compared to the stretch of the long cloth of the turban. And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wraps up and folds up the light. Now just like in another place in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this verb comes again, يُكَوِّرُ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ 
ويكور النهار على الليل it is he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who folds up the night on top of the day and folds the day on top of the night now you know when you wrap up your head with a turban it becomes invisible bit by bit so as you're wrapping as you're wrapping your head becomes invisible invisible up until completely it's invisible you just can't see it anymore so the idea is that the day it loses its light bit by bit bit by bit until completely it's closed off so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ كُوِّرَتْ implies that the sun will lose its light and this is perfectly understood by the tafsir of Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما he said كُوِّرَتْ أي أظلمت كُوِّرَتْ he said it means that the sun has been darkened the light has been wrapped up and taken away and others have taken this literally and said not only it loses its light but the sun will be wrapped up with something like the sun is the head and there's something that will come and wrap around the sun so the sun itself will look like it's been covered up by something so you'll see the sun you'll see the sun but it's not giving off light anymore it's like something has covered it. Something has wrapped it up. Wallahu a'lam. So, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ When the sun, in fact, does get wrapped up, losing its light as a result. And in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, there's an addition in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and after it's wrapped up and it loses its light, it's thrown in the ocean. It's thrown in the ocean. And this some of the scholars have used as proof to prove that the sun is smaller than the earth. The sun is smaller than the earth because eventually this creation gets thrown in the ocean and the ocean engulfs it. So the earth has to be bigger than the sun. And another proof they say is that the sun is a lamp for the earth. Siraj al Munira, it's a lamp for the earth. And always the lamp is smaller than the house. Wallahu alam. As opposed to science, gives you this enormous picture of a sun, and then right next to it grows a dot of the earth. Allahu alam. This is how the scholars have come to give this meaning of that the sun is smaller than the earth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ After this ayat, I'll explain to you why the order is like this as well. So you can't think, why the Allah begin with the sun, then the, then the stars, then the mountains, then it moves around the heat. At the end, we'll explain why. وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ And when in fact, the stars do fall victims to inkidar. The sun, the stars, will fall victims to this inkidar. And inkidar, it refers and it means to lose color and to lose brightness. And it's opposite to safat. So inkidar comes from the word kudra. Kudra means dull and stale in color. Opposite to this is safat. Safat means pure, crystal clear color. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the stars will become dull and they'll become stale. And as shawkani rahimahullah, he comments and he says, Aslu al-inkidar al-insibab. This is another meaning of inkidar. He says the asl, the, the essence of inkidar is insibab, which means to fall, which means to fall. So the first thing is that the stars will lose their color, they will lose their brilliance. And uh, really, we, we can't come to um, up, uh, comprehend this. And we do not appreciate this because we live in the city side. You know, we don't actually know what it means that the stars lose their color and what big of an event that is. We don't. Why? Because due to pollution, and due to lighting in the city, if you look outside now, 
you won't see a lot of stars. It is because due to the pollution that we are in and due to the lighting all around. So that really covers a lot of the stars. But if you were to go to the desert or to the countryside, subhanAllah, you will really appreciate the stars. You'll see millions and millions of them. So now put in your mind that these ayat, the primary audience was Kuffar Quraysh. They're listening to this and they understand. They, they, they see the stars every day. For some of them, the stars are actually, that's their roof at night. That they sleep under the sky and that's what they see. And there's these millions and millions of stars. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the stars will fall victims to inkidah, they'll lose their light, they'll become dull and stale, well that's a big event as well. Just like the sun losing its light and being thrown away. So at first, the stars are dull and stale in its color. Then they start falling. Because we said that il sibab this is an inkidar as Shawkan rahimahullah explained. He said also a meaning of inkidar is il sibab and il sibab means to fall. So we have two things here. They're not contradictory. They're actually stages in which the stars, what happens to the stars. So the first thing is that they just turn off. Just like your light is on, you turn it off, everything's dark. They lose their color, their brilliance. Then they fall. Now, Ibn Abbas anhu, he explains why, and he also explains how they fall. How do they fall? He says that the stars are lamps that are hung, that are suspended and hung between the sky and the earth by chains of light. So these stars we see, they're actually hung by chains of light. And these chains of light are held by angels of light. They're held by angels. So when the first blow of breath in the trumpet takes place, what do we know? Everyone in the heavens and in the earth will die. And also the angels will die. And if the angels die, there's no one to hold the chains. So the chains now are let loose. So what happens? The stars fall. There's no one holding them anymore. So they fall. This is Ibn Abbas anhu's explanation. So two things so far. The most brilliant portion of the day has collapsed. That's gone. That's, that's the most brilliant portion of the day. And the most visible feature of the night has also gone. The, the moon is not the most visible feature. That's most visible probably here in the city. But if you go out in nature and go out to the countryside, you'll find that the most visible feature of the night is actually the stars. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about two visible creations. One in the day, one in the night. Both of them are gone. Both of them have lost their light and both of them have collapsed and now they're falling. So this is what's happening up towards the sky. These two things have happened now up towards the sky. Now if the stars are falling and you want to follow them with your eye, what's the next thing you'll see? What's the next big thing you'll see if you follow the stars as they fall? Mountains. The mountains. That's the first thing you're going to see if you keep falling down with them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now addresses the issue of the mountains. He says, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ And again, you've got to consider these ayat as the highest voice being used here. And in fact, and when in fact the mountains are made to move casually, it's screamed out. Because these are adamant disbelievers. They don't believe in this. So you need to raise your voice so they can start believing and start taking some seriousness to these words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in Surah Al-Nazi'at, we read, وَالْجِبَالَ أَرْسَاهَا What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do to the mountains? He said, He arsaha. He pegged it. He pegged them into the earth. And the word arsaha was used to give us the idea of their, that they're pegged, so pegged into the earth and it's not easy just to pluck out and move them. It's not easy. That cannot be done. So Allah said, used arsaha. The most powerful word of 
pegging something into the earth. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying on this day that they are going to be uprooted and floating about. Now subhanallah, this verb is amazing. Suyirat comes from the verb Sara Yasir. And Sara literally means a casual walk. No effort in your walking. It's as if it's floating. You know, slow paced stroll. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah al Naba, Fakanat Saraba, it becomes like a mirage. Subhanallah, this amazing, gigantic creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of a sudden on this day, it's like a mirage. It's like it's floating. It's moving casually. Suyirat. You know, suyirat, the same, car, the same word is used for a car. Sayyara. Why was the car called Sayyara? Because it moves with no effort as well. What kind of effort is from you? Unless it's broken down and you've got to push it. But other than this, you're in your car, you just press on the accelerator and smoothly, softly it moves. So it's called Sayyara. So anything that has this seen right in it, suyyarat sa'ara yasiru, it'll only refer to something moving with no effort, casually, floating. So subhanallah, this creation of Allah is pulled out of the ground and it's just floating. And so the mountains, they're uprooted, they're floating, and eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns them into carded wool. Carded wool or haba and manthura. It becomes literally dust, sand. It becomes smooth and clean. The land becomes so smooth and clean now, you don't see any mountains or any valleys. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْجِبَالِ فَقُلْ يَنْسِفُهَا رَبِّي نَسْفَى فَيَذَرُهَا قَاعًا صَفْصَفَى لَا تَرَى فِيهَا عِوَجًا وَلَا أَمْتَى they ask you, O oh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning the, the mountains. Then tell them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rip them away from the earth. He'll pluck them out from the earth. And they'll move and they'll move. And they'll become destroyed. They'll become wool. They'll become dust. And then the land will become, will, will become so smooth. La tara fiha iwaja. You will not find any mountain. Wala amta. And it will not contain any valley as well. It will become this smooth type of land. And subhanAllah, one explanation to this, they say that later on we'll get to it where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ You know part of the sign of the Day of Judgment or one of the events of the Day of Judgment is that the ocean becomes set ablaze. So this blaze will go away, will finish. And then the mountains will become dust, will become dirt. And the mountains will fill the place of where the ocean is. So now where the oceans were valleys, that's filled with the dirt of the mountains. So now the land has become flat. This is one explanation. Now, you know, in the mountains where there's greenery and so on, and when there's caves and so on, that's where the wild animals exist. That's where animals exist. You know, the wild animals and the terrain animals and so on, they exist where the mountains are. Especially if there's greenery, and especially also if there is caves. You know, even on snowy mountains, the polar bears and so on, whatever it is, the mountain bee, the, so on. A lot of animals, a lot of wild beasts actually live on mountains. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He turns our attention to what happens to the animals on that day. To what happens. So he says, وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ وَإِذَا الْوَحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Two ayat now talking about the animals. وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ Now al-ishar is the plural of عُشَرَ And عُشَرَ means the she-camel, the female camel that is 10 months pregnant. Why? Because عُشَرَ comes from the word Ashara. Ashara means 10. So, وَإِذَا الْعِشَارِ Al-Ishar is referring to the plural. Allah is saying in these 10 month she camels. That's Ishar. And 
this Isha was very, very important to the Arab because it was the most noble of wealth. It was the most precious and most honored of wealth with the Arabs. This was some serious investment. You know, if you own the Isha, then it's like that's pride and joy. You have a lot of money, a lot of status. And so it's like, it's equivalent to like one of us now, you own a, a like a very expensive real estate or a property, perhaps in Double Bay or Vaucluse or something like this. What that actually implies, it is a status of symbol, right? And it is a lot of money. That's what it is. And Al Ishar back in the days also signified status and it, it signified a lot of lot of wealth. So anyone that owned the Isha, he had some serious wealth. He had some money. Why? Why because, why especially the Isha? Because it's a it's a female first and it's pregnant ten months, it's about to give birth. So now it's not only one camel, it's two camels, so double the benefits. More milk, you know, and more more benefits, more usage of this of this camel. So that's why it was something that was prestige, something that was honored with the Arabs. Basically, Al Ishar in this ayah will mean precious wealth. You know, something that has value, real value. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this Isha, He says on that day, these things that had value, عطلت. عطلت means to become useless, you know, or not to be taken care of. Now the Arabs would use this word عطلت for a woman. If she's not wearing or she's not decked out in jewelry, they'd say imra'atun mu'attala. That means that she's useless. What's the point of a woman if she's not beautified by jewelry for the people, for the society? So they'd say, There's no use. In other words, the only use of a woman in society is that she beautifies herself by jewelry, then now she has a purpose. This is, يعني, subhanAllah, the, the ignorance, uh, the, the mindset of the people of ignorance, especially of the disbelievers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al Hajj, Wa bi'rim mu'attala. He speaks about a town that has been destroyed. Khawiyatun ala urushiha. It's completely turned over. And he speaks of a well that's within this town. And what has happened to this, the, the town, the, the town is dead. And what happens to that well, it's gone to waste. So Allah says, a useless well. You know, in other words, a well is something that use, that's useful. But if the town is dead and there's no one in the town, it's, uh, it's not useful anymore. There's no use of it anymore. There's no one in the town, no one will benefit from it. So that's what mu'attala means. Mu'attala will mean something that has value, but it doesn't have any more meaning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying about this most precious asset, this Isha, it's wandering around useless. And, and this she camel, it wasn't something that you saw wandering around. If you saw a she camel, you would find security around it, you'll find a fence around it, it's been taken care of, perhaps it's also got a rope on it, people have taken care of this. This is precious asset. But on this, this day, when the human who owns this kind of wealth, he sees the sun being wrapped up, and he sees the stars falling, and he sees the mountains sailing away, then this Isha becomes useless to him. He doesn't care about it anymore. So SubhanAllah, you gotta understand the psychology of this ayah. You know, SubhanAllah, now the recent bushfires, all right? The houses of these people were threatened by fire. Now, if your house is threatened by fire, you don't talk about how much money you got in your savings, or how much money you got in your drawer, or where your iPad is, where your iPhone is, where you left your wallet. You don't talk about this. What do you talk about? You only talk about how am I going to survive? 
How am I going to get out of this place? That's the only thing you're concerned about. And subhanAllah, wa idha al-isha wa uttilat. People are feed, they feed the bushfire so they didn't care about their assets. This same image happens on the day of judgment. It's so scary, it's so frightening out there. People are so afraid. Just look up and see what's happening to the sun. The sun is there and it's wrapped up. And the stars are just dropping and falling and they're losing their light. And you see the mountains and all of a sudden they're sailing. Who cares about the Rishad anymore? Who cares about it? So what if you had $2 million in the bank? What would you care? You know, just like think of yourself in, for example, in a plane crash. The plane is just heading, it's crashing. And it's crashed and now everyone's looking for their survival. You don't care where your iPad is and where your laptop is. You don't care about all this now. And that's something precious. That's something valuable. That's equivalent to Risha, for example. So this is, subhanAllah, the psychology of the ayah. And you know, then during these days of the bushfires, people would post uh, pictures and comments about, oh, subhanAllah, did you see the sky covered in spoke? It reminds me of, uh, you know, wait and see when the, the, when the sky fills up with smoke. And subhanAllah, well, that was terrifying. If you saw that outside, it was a sight. You know, the sky was almost just pitch black. In during the day, we're talking. And not only this, also what happened, and they're running away from their houses, also should have made you think of why the al So not only the smoke you should be thinking of, oh, this reminds me of the Day of Judgment, but if you were to see the state of the people running away from their homes, you should also be remembering the Day of Judgment. This also should come into mind. Now, subhanAllah, uh, this surah, it spoke about a first pregnancy. One pregnancy was mentioned. This is about the camel that's 10 months <coughs> pregnant. And in Juz Amma, there's another mention of a pregnant camel. And subhanAllah, when we get to it, and that's in Surah Jashams, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about uh, the people of Salih, and the camel that they actually slaughtered and they killed. And that was a pregnant camel as well. They, subhanAllah, beautifully tied together. When we get there, inshaAllah, we'll explain the relation. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on. And He says, still talking about the animals. He says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Al-Wuhush is a plural of Wahsh. And the wahsh literally is ma la yusta'nasu min dawab bil bar. That's a wahsh. That's the literal translation meaning of wahsh. And it is it's the animal that does not have affection to others on land. That's what a wahsh is. So in other words, it's referring to the undomesticated animals. The animals that are wild. The animals that you can't tame. And it attacks directly when it sees other animals in focus. That's a wahush, that's a wahsh. And it is opposite to uns. Uns, that's where the word insan comes from. You see, the word insan comes from the word uns. And uns means affection. So that's why the man was called insan, because he actually has affection. While the animal, the wild animal was called wahsh, because he doesn't have affection. Right? But subhanAllah, as we go on, watch this beautiful contrast between Surah Abasa and Surah al taqwir I'll explain with you at the end. Now, so we said Wahsh, it's the word that's used for the animal that doesn't have affection to others. Also, the word Wahsh, for example, <coughs> the Arab used to use it in his speech, he would say, Masha fil ardi Wahsha. That means that he walked walked on earth wahsha. And that would mean that he walked by himself. So wahsha also means to walk by yourself. So now these two ideas of wahsh, how do they come together? This illustrates, obviously when you say masha fil ardi wahsha, what that is illustrating, it's, it's illustrating that this man was hard to get along with. Hard, you couldn't walk with him. So as a result, he walks alone. 
He walks by himself, no companion. And subhanAllah, this is true for the wuhush, for the wild beasts, the wild animals, the undomesticated animals, you'll always find them walking alone. They don't walk with anyone. So these are two things. They have no affection, no love to animals. They'll attack at first sight. And another thing, wahsh meant walking by yourself. And also that's real with the wahush. They walk alone, they walk by themselves because no other animal can get along with them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَإِذَنْ وَحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ What happens to these wuhush? That, that by nature they don't walk with any other animal. What happens? Allah is saying that this nature is axed. Now hushirat. They're gathered. <coughs> They're herded together. Hushirat means to herd together. There's another word also in the Arabic language means together. And that's jama'a. Hasharat and jama'a. But jama'a is more appropriate with humans. Rabbana innaka jami'un nas. You're going to gather the people. Why? Because the people, by their nature, they can be gathered. There's affection amongst them, right? So, نحن, alhamdulillah, as believing brothers, we're gathered in this masjid. That's why we were called insan, from the affection we have, the love we have for one another. So we can sit side by side to each other, no problem. But the animal, Allah says, حشرت. And حشرت is a verb used to hurt animals. In other words, when the animals are gathered, so you don't gather them on their own accord. Animals don't like to be with each other. You need to force them. So this word hushirat implies this uh, action of forcing. You know, just like the shepherd, he's got his stick, he's running around his, his cattle, for example, and he hits one to get it in line and hits the other one to get it in line. Because by instinct, they, they just like to be by themselves. So that's the word hushirat. It comes perfectly for al wuhush. And one of the names of the Day of Judgment is Yawm Al-Hashar. Yawm Al-Hashar, the Day of Gathering. And the idea is that there are some people in this world that don't like to be with others. <coughs> but eventually Allah called that day Yawm Al-Hashar because whether you like it or not, you're all going to be gathered. Whether you like to be gathered with Him or not, you're all going to be gathered and end up in one place and that is فَإِذَاهُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةِ We explain this in Surah Al-Nazi'at. We're all getting ready for the questioning then. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, He doesn't say وَإِذَا الْأَنْعَامُ وَحُشِرَتْ So you got to make difference between وحوش and أَنْعَام so you can appreciate this. Al-An'am is the tame, the domesticated animal. And Al-Wuhush is the undomesticated animal. In other words, when Allah says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ It's talking about the animals that would never stand together and are never standing, they never stand together in this life. And now on the Day of Judgment, Allah is saying they are standing right next to each other. إِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ And subhanAllah, the closest thing you will see in this world of this wild beasts gathering is when there's a flood. You know, when there's a flood and there's only a tiny bit of safety land left, you'll find all the animals on it. Why? Because now there's a greater fear and that's the flood. So now the hunter, the, under, the undomesticated animal is standing side by side to the domesticated animal. Although that's his prey, if he saw it before the flood, he would have probably ate it. But now because they all share a common fear, and that's the flood. So you'll find them standing side by side, all fearing this flood. That's the only closest image you'll find of the wuhush of the wild beasts when they're gathered together. So also, so subhanAllah, the mountains are moving and the sun has become dark and the stars are falling. Now the animals have a greater fear in common causing them to lose their natural instinct of attack and of fear of each other. So now they're standing next to each other because of what's happening on that day. So now there's a bigger fear. 
So now I don't care who's the attack, the one that attacks me, I don't care who eats me, there's a bigger fear now, look what's going on. So now they're standing right next to each other. Now subhanAllah, this is the contrast I wanted to share with you in Surah Abasa and Surah at taqweed Appreciate this. In Surah Abasa, right at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي When the human, when an insan, when the human, he runs away from his brother, right? But the human, we said, an insan comes from which word? Al-uns. Al-uns means affection. So the humans in this world were together by nature. Because affection, by nature, they're together in this world. But on that day, on the day of judgment, what happens to the insan? What happens to the insan? They run away from each other, right? Because they've lost their nature. Now in Surah al taqweer and Wuhush that came from the word Wahsh, that meant <coughs> that the animals are apart in this world, they're apart from each other by nature. And on the Day of Judgment, what happens? They run towards in together because their nature is lost. SubhanAllah. So the humans in this world, they're together. On that day, you're running away from your brother, from the closest people that you had loved for. And in this world, the wild beasts are away from each other by nature. And on that day, the nature is lost because of due to tremendous fear. So what happens? They're together. SubhanAllah, the contrast is, is amazing in this ayat. So there's a total reversal of the world's normal pattern because of the extreme fear that people experience on that day. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and perhaps we'll conclude with this ayah for the adhan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ And when in fact the oceans become as blazing fire. Now there are two words that are used for bah in the Qur'an, in, in the sense of plural. You could say abhur and you could say bihar. Abhur would mean few oceans. Bihar will mean all of the oceans. So in the Arabic you have this, this singular, then you have the pair, the dual form, then you have the plural, then you have the super plural, like the plural squared, the plural of the plural. So in this sense, when we say abhur, that's the plural, and the plural of this plural is bihar. So Allah says, wa al bihar. Why is this important to, to yani, share? Because now Allah is speaking about all the oceans. What happens to them? Sujirat. Sujirat is also an interesting word. The Arabs would say, Sajjartu tanur. That'll mean there's a large pot with coal and fuel in it. And then you throw a flame in it. It will spark. That's sujirat. That's sujirat. And so the water in the ocean on that day will be used as a fuel for the fire. The water now that you see on the ocean is actually a fuel for a fire that's to come. That's sujirat. And some of the scholars, subhanAllah, have explained, and this is a very strong opinion, that Jahannam, the hellfire, is located beneath the oceans. So on that day, the ocean becomes set ablaze, and then it becomes like a drop of fire in the hellfire that's below. That's where it will sink. And this is a very, very strong opinion uh, that's shared also, you find, in the, in the Tafasir book. So that's why some of the scholars, when he used to, when some of their friends would come and say, let's go out on a sea voyage, he used to say, are you, are you an idiot? You're going on Jahannam. So he'd refuse to go on a sea voyage because he'd believe that this is actually Jahannam. What are you going to set a sail on Jahannam? Yani? So they'd refuse this. Yeah, this, is, this, is, yani, this is a strong opinion. And maybe I, probably this is the first time you're exposed to this. But keep in mind these, these opinions and these sayings 
are opinions as sayings of companions. And they're recorded in the Tafasir books. So yani, when, when you read the Tafasir books, you'll find a lot of views that are shared. So I'm trying just to uh, get the most strongest of views, the most correct of views, inshallah ta'ala. And this is all Allahu Akbar. This is just the exploration of the Sahabiya, which who had more knowledge than us yani, in this field. But also, Sushirat <coughs> carries the meaning of Muli'at. Muli'at. And Muli'at means to fill up and eventually flood. So for example, you could say, Sajjartul Hawd. That means you turn on the tap in the sink and you close down the sink from the bottom and the sink will start filling up water, water, water. It keeps filling up until eventually what happens? The water will, will basically will pour out. It will pour out of the sink. What's used to describe this? The same verb, Sujjirat. Now what does this mean? The idea is that the oceans on the Day of Judgment will flood and as a result oceans will become ocean they'll all become one ocean because they all flood and they all cover each other now it's like one huge ocean and this also uh, means that the salt water will mix with the fresh water and this is I mean it's important to know because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah uh, al-Rahman uh, speaks about the two oceans that, that subhanallah move right along each other and they don't mix. They don't mix. And we saw this in, in Egypt. Yani this is Majba al Bahrain. Subhanallah. Allah, He made a barzakh between them, a barrier, a wall. But on that day, everything will mix. It will become one ocean. And it starts to flood. Muli'at means it starts to flood and it boils over. It just passes the shoreline. It's flooding. And perhaps this explains why the wild beasts are gathered. Because of the flood now that's happening, there's no more land, there's just a bit of land, so they're all herded right next to each other on this land because of the flood. Wallahu a'lam, according to that sir. All these ayat up until now weren't about the human weren't about the human they were about either the animals the wild beasts or were about huge things like the sun the stars the oceans you know the, the mountains this yani subhanallah these different stages are from bad to worse to worse now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We'll speak about the human. But before we speak about the human, let me just share with you the, the order of these ayat. Either shamsu wa even nujumu These two events take place where? Up towards the sky. Wa either jibanu suyirat, wa either lisharu utilat, wa either wuhushu hushirat. Four events take place when? Huh? Land. So two up in the earth and two and four on the land. In how many days was the sky created? Two days. So two a. In how many days was the earth created? Four days. Four days. So four ayat for the earth. SubhanAllah, it's intricate details. Amazing, profound miracles of the Qur'an. The, the sky was created in two days. So Allah spoke about two major events that happened. And then four ayat were dedicated for the earth because the earth was created in four days. Now, The last thing Allah created in the sky was the sun. That's the last thing Allah created in the sky. So that's the first to be destroyed. Huh? Where's the proof? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, He finished the creation of the skies in two days. 
First created the, the sky, then after that, he placed the stars, and then he placed the sun. So what was created last is destroyed first. That's in reference to the sky. Now, in reference to the earth, what was created last? Huh? Now what was created last? You, you should already know. The, the mountains. The mountains. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, أَخْرَجَ مِنْهَا مَا أَهَا That he brought out the oceans, the water, the river, the lakes, or whatever it is. وَمَرْعَاهَا And then the grazing land. Then what? وَالْجِبَالْ أَرْسَاهَا As the final thing. So what was created last is destroyed first. So in terms of the sky, the sun was created last, so Allah began with it. And on the earth, the mountains were created last, and they're the first to be destroyed, so Allah began with it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of people of the Quran, people who benefit from the reminders of the Quran. إنه ولي ذلك وقادر عليه وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين